Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I'm glad that NCER and IPF has got a star-studded panel because they're competing with the cricket match. And the fact that <laughs> and the fact that all of you, so many of you are here, shows their star attraction. We now, need to warn Sam Fisher about this. <laughs> so I have been told to be merciless with grace and charm, so that's what I'll be. So before I call on Maitrish and Karthik to give their presentation, I'll just say a few words. See, the uh, revolution in digital technology, the introduction of Aadhaar, and the expansion of banking network has opened up a lot of possibilities. And we have seen state governments, particularly Andhra Pradesh, then later we saw Telangana, Orissa, introducing Rayatabandhu, Kalia. Then uh, in 2013, I think, 1st January, Government of India started this direct benefit transfer on a pilot basis. Slowly it has expanded, and you have seen what, it has, ha what has happened later. Then we know that there was a proposal, uh, actually not the proposal, the Government of India implemented PM Kisan, I think from December last year. The o Congress party, which is in the opposition, they suggested there should be NAI. And there are various economists who have talked about income transfer. There are basically three variations. One is to a particular group, like PM Kisan, NAI, Kalia, Rayatabandhu. The second is to poor people targeted. That's what I think many of the economists have talked about. Then there was the universal basic income proposal, which is universal and basic in the sense it also has a minimum amount that will ensure it's targeted. It's not targeted, it's universal, but it will make the poor come out of the poverty line. What Maitrish and Karthik bring to the table is a universal model, not a basic income. They've cut the quote according to the cloth, and they're suggesting just 1% of GDP. So with these words, I'll ask Maitrish and Karthik, whoever, not both of you at the same time, only one, uh, to speak. As you know, the you have got exactly 30 minutes, and is I'll let time? you know when the 30 is. Quarter past two, so your time will be over at quarter two. Two forty. Two forty-eight. About two eighteen. Um, so thanks. Uh, it's 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 a little awkward as kind of IPF editor to also be an author, but the story here is you know uh, I was mandated with uh, commissioning a paper for Maitrish and who's done a lot of work on 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 income transfers, and we were just brainstorming the outline of this paper, and he said you know I'll do it if you do it with me, and so you know that's how this happened, and but it's been a lot of fun along the way. Um, so let me uh, do this quickly, and I think you know there's uh, there's a lot to cover. But there's also a lot of stuff that's been covered before. So the background, again, everybody knows um, huge interest in both academic and policy circles in the idea of a universal basic income. Um, this is true in both developed and developing countries. In developed countries, the thrust is coming more from the concerns of automation and the destruction of industrial jobs on a very large scale. In developing countries, I think the thrust has come a little bit more from understanding the weaknesses of existing programs with the suggestion that maybe it may be more efficient to replace these increasing incredibly leaky in-kind programs um, with, with, uh, with income transfers of various sorts. And notice that we'll use the term income transfers throughout as opposed to cash to make it very clear that everything we're talking about refers to money transferred into a bank account and not given out physically in cash. So I think it's useful to frame it with that term. <clears throat> And I think, I think what makes this paper exciting at this time is this is no longer an economist pipe dream. This has kind of really caught the policy and political imagination in a way that just wasn't true even 18 months ago. So, you know, PM Kisan is already going to be one of the largest unconditional cash transfer programs in the world, unconditional in the sense of targeted, but not conditional on actual actions at about 0.5% of GDP. So, 
And now, but this, this move is, all, all, as with any major move, there's also been criticisms and, you know, many critics. But broadly, I would say along two categories. Like, I think our, our Ratan Roy in particular, I think, has said that, you know, basically moving towards income transfers is kind of saying that you're giving up on a developmental state and moving towards a compensatory state. That we as a state are saying that we cannot provide basic services and therefore we're going to make up by giving you income. And on the other side, folks like Jean Drez have been concerned that this is really a Trojan horse um, that's going to basically, you know, take away rights that are, are more judiciable, like say a right to food, but you, a right to cash is not nearly judiciable in the same way, and they talk about concerns about indexation, inflation, and other concerns. So, so what are we doing in this paper? At some level, there is so much ground, so much has been written about this. I think we went back and forth a couple of times on whether we truly have anything new to say. And it turns out we do, um, and partly because I think while the evidence has been around for a long, sorry, the theory has been around for a long time, you know, we've been working in these areas for the last three years in different, for three to five years, um, actually looking at last mile implementation of different kinds of DBT programs. And I think there's a lot we've learned from that implementation experience that I think has informed our thinking on how we think about the policy. Um, we're also using the policy momentum created by PM Kisan to then examine questions of optimal design, including targeting amount supplementation versus substitution, and more importantly, I think just placing income transfers in a broader portfolio of anti-poverty strategies. I think our view is that part of the discussion has been colored by this all or nothing with kind of income versus in kind, and you know that kind of gets people very bipolar uh, reactions. And our view is, as with everything else, income transfers should be seen as one in a portfolio of policy choices that we have, and then <clears throat> We're going to end with like a very specific policy suggestion, um, what we call an inclusive growth dividend. And the core idea here is, I think, you know, what all our experience in the field plus the political economy, which Arvind has also written about, suggests that, you know, almost all the UBI discussions have assumed that the fiscal space for this is going to come from some kind of elimination of existing programs. And both the practical experience and the political economy suggest that it's incredibly hard to change existing spending, but it is much more feasible to change the the marginal rupee that is allocated for anti-poverty spending. And so basically put together, we think that the UBI discussion and the substitution discussion has actually held back the country from realizing the gains of a universal, very modest supplemental income transfer. So we basically think supplementation is what is going to be viable from a political economy perspective. And I think the other thing which we really want to highlight in this paper is that so much of the thinking around income transfers is kind of colored by poverty reduction and therefore as a palliative without recognizing that we have so much theory and evidence suggesting that this can also increase productivity. So it's the increase that close to subsistence, we have so much evidence that there in fact no trade-off between equity and efficiency. And that's I think what's motivating us to make sure, to try and give this idea a bit of a push um, to make it actually happen, okay? so. The outline of the talk is, yeah, just discuss the key conceptual issues pretty fast, go through the details of our specific proposal, and discuss an implementation roadmap. So there are a lot of conceptual issues, and I have about a slide on each of these. But, you know, I think there's the, the first core two issues are just going to be thinking about income transfers versus direct provision, substitution versus supplementation, targeted versus universal, concerns about how people will spend the money, work incentives, female empowerment, borrowing constraints, risk, and saving constraints. So it, it hits almost like every topic in development economics in some way is kind of addressed you know, in one form or the other by uh, by, by the policy at hand. So I think, like I've already said, the critics argue that income transfers are basically going to crowd out other public expenditure and that you're moving towards a compensatory state. So how should we assess this concern? Okay, And I think, again, the public discourse here could benefit from a little bit more clarity between you know, what is obvious to most public finance folks. Uh, Shekhar, can you make that more clearly visible? I'll, I'll need that. <laughs> the, mm, which is the distinction between public goods and publicly provided private goods, or public goods and redistribution. So in theory, like most of us think of the government as being about providing public goods, except if you go look at the data, right, like I mean, and again, Arvind and I discussed this in our conversation four years ago, is one of the things about Indian political economy and history is because we democratized at such a low level of per capita income, the political pressure for redistribution hits much, much earlier in the development cycle. And so what that means is if you look at the patterns of public expenditure, 
expenditure, what we spend on redistribution is so much larger than what we spend on public goods. And in redistribution, I'm including publicly provided services like goods and education, health and education, because in principle, there's no reason the market can't provide that. But the government comes in with a view of saying we will make this free and therefore accessible. So the logic of production in these cases is really a redistribute logic as opposed to a productive efficiency logic. Okay, so and. And once you kind of recognize, see, for most economists, if I were to tell you that I'm crowding out genuine public goods with an income transfer, we would say, no, the public good should come first. But if you look at the expenditure, just one sector, see, agriculture has 11 times more funding for interest and fertilizer subsidies than all of agricultural research and extension. Okay, And in, if you look at education, if you look at health, we, in all of these sectors, we spend way more on direct provision rather than what would be classified as a public good. So I think that's the first point of clarity. That like it or not, the political economy is going to demand a very large fraction of public expenditure goes into redistribution. And then the question really is, what is the quality of that public expenditure? So when somebody says, on the margin, you should be spending this money on health or education, that has to then be analyzed through the filter of how efficient is our existing spending. And so Again, we've got tons of work on this in the past 15 or 20 years. And the punchline is that quality of public expenditure is incredibly low. Okay, So uh, starting from documenting estimates of teacher and doctor absenteeism that Jeff and I did now 18 years ago, um, you know, and, and, and we've got now RCT evidence, we've got observational evidence. And bottom line is that the public and public sec private sector in health and education doesn't provide much better quality on average once you adjust for selection, but it does it at a much lower cost. And it does that because the wages are much lower and accountability is higher. And so one just striking way to think about this larger discourse when we talk about more public funding, if you want to think about how much value destruction there is in the status quo of public provision, just ask what does it say about the quality of your product that you can't even give it away for free, okay? So, you know, because that's basically what the story is. Not only is it free, you have a negative price, okay? So with public schooling, you're providing midday meals, you're providing uniforms, you're providing books. So it's a negative price and people are still choosing of their own volition to go pay on the market. Okay, so now but one important point is I don't want to subscribe to this easy fallacy that comes from there that says, and many people do this, right? Like I mean the previous government probably had too much of a <clears throat> too much of a state-led approach. But I think, you know, in the current dispensation, I've often heard people say, why don't we just shut this all down and just give people vouchers because the market will do this better. And I think, again, the evidence says that we need to be cautious before we make a claim like that because what you see is there's incredible heterogeneity between public and private across time and space. And there's also heterogeneity across providers. So there's this very nice paper in Liberia done by my student Maurizio that's just kind of accepted at the AER. And what they're doing is looking at this really controversial like public-private partnerships program in Liberia and they find that on average the private does better but their design allows them to look at the entire distribution of productivity and you see that there are high quality pub private and really low quality private as well okay so I think what this highlights is that on average public provision is clearly less efficient than market but there is so much heterogeneity that any blanket move to say one you know shut down one and go to the other is probably going to be a mistake so I think one unifying idea that's come through a lot of work we've done over the years is how do you account for this heterogeneity in thinking about public versus private? And you know, the only ethically, politically viable way to do this seems to be to empower the beneficiary with a little bit more choice. Okay, so this is something we've done in the PDS. And the key idea is that neither public nor private, but you just get better accountability. Now, of course, even with a model like this, you'll need other design issues, like what kind of information, disclosure, regulation, are people capable of making informed choices and things like health and education. But those issues are relevant even today, given that 50% of provision is private in education and 80% of provision is private in health. So those issues are not going to go away just because you do something like this. All that this is doing is saying, think of, on the margin of an income transfer as improving the accountability of public public expenditure, which is this index fund framing which we have, which we think is quite powerful. So substitution versus supplementation, um, I think what we've seen in the data, and this is an important new piece of kind of evidence, is we've done process monitoring of the government's attempt to do DBT in PDS in the three union territories. We've looked at data in Jharkhand. We've looked at data where different kinds of substitution programs. And bottom line is that last mile implementation is weak. Okay, So even when the government says that 95% or 99% of the transfers have gone out, when we go to the household, about one third of them say we haven't gotten anything. Okay, Now, sometimes it's something as simple as the money has gone to an account that they're not using or they haven't got 
got an intimation that the money has come. But the implication is that even those of us who think that there is inefficiency in public provision, we cannot in good conscience recommend blanket substitution because the worst, the most vulnerable will be hurt. Okay? So, and I think the other important point is that the political economy just makes it impossible or next to impossible to remove existing programs. So I think the entire UBI discussion, I think, has all the right theoretical discussions. But the basic place where I think it fails is that the only way to make the fiscal math work is you either substitute away existing programs or you kind of have a big increase in GDP per capita, in, in tax to GDP ratio. And both of those, I think, like are not going to happen. And so the political economy of expenditure has already shown that the pathway the country is moving on is supplementation. So RBS and PM Kisan are supplementing, they're not taking out anything. Now, you could argue that this will open up a spigot for a, one more kind of transfers that politicians will kind of then start abusing. But there is a fiscal limit, which people are aware of. So I think, again, going back to Arvind and my conversation, is that I think most of us would be very, very happy that the marginal rupee allocated for farmer welfare is going to non-distorting income transfers relative to more subsidies or more free electricity or more farm loan waivers or other things that give you more factor misallocation relative to the income transfer. So, I think, basically, like I said, relying on substitution for fiscal space is likely to delay the benefit of income transfers, whereas a modest supplementary income transfer to all citizens allows us to get started in the pathway towards realizing the many benefits of income transfers in the portfolio of anti-poverty programs. So targeted versus universality, this is very well covered. I think you know all the problems of targeting are known, errors of inclusion, exclusion, corruption, leakage. And I think people don't even calculate the true economic cost is the distortion of effort people put in to get on these lists, right? Not to mention the administrative cost and the distortion that comes from there. And interestingly, universal programs also have broader political support. So, now, the main advantage of targeting, of course, is you can have a much larger amount for the people who are poor. But that, in turn, increases the effort put in getting on these lists. But the other subtle point that people forget is that the larger the transfer to the targeted group, the larger the distortion to work incentives from the phase out period, because you have to phase it out, which is going to create high marginal taxes, which I'll come back to in a second. So again, in the Indian context, I think PM Kisan is a much better program design, you know, much better than NIAI. Um, which I won't get into details. So this I'm going to do very quickly. I think you know this 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 is a dog that everybody raises but just doesn't bark. Okay. So this concern that people may spend the money badly, like I mean, there's just no support. I think the only place where there's some evidence of this happens is when people get windfalls. Okay. So if you win a lottery, or if you're a poor farmer who's kind of sold your land to a developer and gets a lump sum payment, then there is some evidence that people spend those big lump sums badly. Okay. But when income is coming in predictable small annuities, there's no evidence whatsoever. Now, I think the one problem that happens is many bureaucrats, suppose you're in a given department and thinking about food versus you know, food versus cash. People think that people should spend 100% of the income on their vertical, okay? And that's where this idea that people may misuse money comes from. So if you're PDS and say, if I give people money, they'll misuse it on health and education. Really? Right? Like, you know, so, you know, and that's just completely the wrong way to think about it. So, you know, overall, the evidence is that the income is used roughly proportional to the income elasticity of different categories of spending. And if you aggregate across, if you say that in a counterfactual world, I would have allocated this money proportional to income elasticity broadly, like, I mean, you'll end up with the same results. So work incentives, again, you know, Ab Abhijit's done tons of reviews on this, uh, Ben and Reem have done reviews. There is just no evidence whatsoever, okay, of negative work incentives on cash transfers. And if anything, I think what is unappreciated, most of these studies are talking about the income effect and showing that there's relatively little income effect of getting additional income on leisure, right? So that's why work doesn't go down. But what these are not capturing is my kind of, at least my read of the US evidence, is that the biggest work disincentives come not from the income effect, but the very high marginal tax rate during the phase out period. Okay, So if you're in the US at an income of under $20,000, you're getting Medicare, you're getting a bunch of stuff. But if that's phasing out between 20 and 30,000, then you're paying high marginal tax rates of 50, 60, 70%. And that, in fact, is more likely to create a poverty trap because there is no incentive to move out of the targeted category. Okay, So in converse, like you know, and, and, and a universal modest supplement is likely to have almost no negative effects. And if anything, I'm almost convinced that you're going to get positive effects in work incentives, um, partly because of insurance, and I'll talk about that. 
Now here's another issue. So our design, what we envisage is that it's not a household level transfer, but it's a transfer for every individual, including allowance for the children going into the mother's accounts, okay? And so, and we think that's a really big deal, not just in terms of female empowerment, but there's this very nice recent paper showing how much intra-household inequality there is, okay? So given the gradient within households where women and children systematically, and particularly girls, get less of the household income share, you can often have poor people in non poor households and non-poor people in poor households because of this gradient, okay? So taking what we know about the impact of putting money in female accounts on both empowerment, employment, and kind of child welfare, this actually may improve targeting if you manage to do something like that. Then there's borrowing constraints, probably like, you know, one of the oldest topics in all of development economics. Um, we think credit constraints are what hold back people. And so, but if you look at the, so at one level, we see that returns on capital are very high from a whole bunch of RCTs where you helicopter drop capital. But once you go through the intermediation cost of a microcredit process, the evidence is much more mixed, okay? So you still get positive returns on the right tail of the businesses who get microcredit, but on average, you're not seeing much effect on consumption, okay? So one read of this literature is that credit is not gonna be transformative. But a slightly different view, which I kind of subscribe to, is that people actually have either consumption smoothing or investment opportunities that are generating returns of about 25%, but that is completely being eaten up in the interest cost, okay? So if giving you finance makes you on, you know, modestly better off without being transformative, it means you have an IRR of 25%, but the high intermediation cost of microcredit means that most of that is swallowed up in the interest payments, okay? So if you were to able to kind of move people into a cycle of savings with that same amount, you could in fact end up having a big positive effect. So, so in this view, a small monthly transfer could deliver the benefits of credit, at least for consumption smoothing. So this may not be big enough for investment unless you save it, which we'll come to next, without the intermediation costs, okay? which is a huge cost um, because the ticket sizes are small and as the chairman knows, by virtue of being like, you know, <clears throat> the chairman of a, of a, of a payments bank. Okay? Um, and then there's very nice recent evidence, in fact, it's a macro paper, but job market can from LSE. And what it shows is that the standard credit constraints model says that what the lender cares about is collateral, okay? But what the evidence is suggesting that is what lenders care about is cash flow, right? Which is your, because collateral is often illiquid, okay? So, and so having a little bit of predictable cash flow can actually crowd in a lot more formal credit because of the ability to then service that debt. And then tying to another piece of recent evidence that Rohini Pandey and others did with the field experiment, that one of the problems with microcredit is because they want to discipline the payment they require you to start paying back week by week immediately, right? So if you want to make a slightly illiquid capital investment that has a return over a longer period, what they show is stretching out like, I mean, or more flexibility in the payment schedule actually allows for more productivity enhancing investments. And so again, what a program like this would do is you could use these transfers to service the debt while you're in fact making a longer term, more illiquid and more productive investment. And then there's risk. So again, you know, we just forget, you know, how when people are close to subsistence, right? Like, I mean, there's very little formal insurance. Um, and even, but there's also evidence that with a little bit of insurance, farmers will choose crops that have higher average returns, you know, and there's higher investment. And so this is just so obvious once you think about it, right? So what is development? The process of development is the aggregation of individuals undertaking investments that have positive NPV. But even if the return is positive, there's a distribution around these returns and any new activity is risky, right? So whether it's migration, for which we have like stunning new evidence, right? So both, um, so, Ka so Kaiva and Munshi has work showing there's not enough rural urban migration and this lovely experiment in Bangladesh that just shows how giving people the money of a bus ticket, like I mean substantially improved migration, search, employment and reduced poverty and mainly because even though the job is available 60 kilometers away, people so close to subsistence can't even afford to pay the search cost of going and finding that better job, okay? So these are all ways in which for people close to subsistence, like this small transfer, which for a household would be close to 500 rupees a month, could actually increase productivity as opposed to reduce it. And then savings we've talked about. And again, like, you know, if we can move people from, if you think about the cycle of credit versus the cycle of saving, what is credit is I borrow for a consumption event and then I pay installments, I pay, I pay, I pay, and then I borrow again, okay? Now, if I can get people into the same cycle but with savings where you pay, you pay, but you pay yourself and then you consume instead of kind of borrowing, the, the cumulative internal rate of return on that over multiple cycles is enormous because about 25, 30% per cycle, okay? But banks have 
zero interest in promoting savings products because those are low margin products, right? These, you lose a lot of money kind of pushing savings accounts. So banks would much rather push credit because that's where the margins are, okay? So, but what we have is we have a robust evidence that when you put money directly in bank accounts, um, there's an RCT recently showing this, right? That moving money directly to beneficiary bank accounts as opposed to giving out in cash substantially increases savings, okay? So an income transfer combined with bank accounts is likely to meaningfully boast formal savings rate. So given all of these advantages, right, like, you know, why aren't we doing this? And I think the reason we're not doing this is partly because when we think about income transfers, when you start putting big numbers of GDP per capita, people just freeze as saying, oh, this is just not realistic. This is some pipe dream, like, you know, I mean that some, you know, some, some economist fantasy of eradicating poverty with income, and this is never going to happen, okay? So I think our main point here is that less is more, okay? Less is more because it will let us get down this path of universal Universality and put a predictable monthly income supplement in the account of every Indian citizen. So we call this an inclusive grow dividend, and at it's, it's pegged at 1% of GDP per capita, which right now is about 110 rupees per month per person. And what's interesting is this is exactly the same value as PM Kisan. So PM Kisan is 500 rupees per household per month, and for a household of 4.6, that's exactly 110 to 115. So, so the concern that Arvind has raised to me in the past that these amounts are too small to excite politicians, I think is now empirically not true, because you can now package this as saying this is the equivalent of exactly PM Kisan value, except that you go universal, and we'll discuss several advantages of this approach. So again, so just going to, oh, I've got 11. That's what Shekhar's timer shows. Me. I, I was following that timer. Okay. So, yeah. mm. <laughs> that would be like losing half my endowment at this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let's just talk quickly about terminology, right? I think part of the problem, in my view, with basic income is that it connotes an amount that's adequate to live on, okay? And so rightfully or wrongfully, that connotes the sense of, oh, people are going to get lazy once you're able to kind of, you know, the, they can take care, you know, you can basically give them a dole. Uh, but it also sets the expectation large enough, and like we've said, it's just infeasible to implement this without eliminating existing subsidies or massively raising tax to GDP, and both of those are just practically and politically daunting tasks, okay? So by calling this a dividend, we're making it very clear that this is one component of a portfolio of income streams that people would have, okay? It's not everything, but it's not meaningless, as we'll show you in terms of quantities. Um, inclusive captures the built-in progressivity of the idea. We believe that exclusion errors will be much lower, though that's an empirical question. And the amount being the same for all citizens, the marginal value is obviously much, much higher for the poorest. So there's progressivity built in. And the growth captures the idea that the amount will grow with the growth of the economy. And so that basically like, you know, protects you from inflation, protects you from, and also makes you share in the growth process. So put together, the IGD is a powerful symbol of universally shared prosperity that connects every citizen regardless of income or station. So Pranab pointed out that in fact, the term is similar to what Sunil Khilani had written in an op-ed in 2011 called a citizen's growth dividend, which he had pegged, pegged at two and a half percent. So again, we're not claiming particular originality in any of these ideas, right? It's all been around. I think our main goal is to see if we can somehow accelerate the process that this will actually happen, okay? And happen in a sensible, feasible way, given the window opened up by PM Kisan, like, you know, and the Finance Commission, which I'll talk about. So, like I said, it's affordable enough to be feasible, right? Um, so the, it's literally exactly double PM Kisan because PM Kisan is about half the population, 0.5% of GDP. So it's in the feasible set to be supplemental. But it also improves on PM Kisan, again, PM Kisan is much better than Nyai for a bunch of reasons. Most importantly, you don't have this massive reversal at 20% uh, and don't have targeting, but it's going to reach landless laborers. It's going to be independent of title. It's the most vulnerable are in fact not those with land. Um, and I think the other structural concern with PM Kisan is it could increase misallocation and distortion because if you're tying it to people staying on farming, that's kind of going to impede your structural transformation where, you know, the truth is like, Shamika Ravi in the PMEAC said, the best way to double farmers' income is to halve the number of farmers. Like, you know, the US produces the food, larger amounts of food with 2% of the workforce. The productivity per worker in the US is about 50 to 60 times higher, right? So the concern with a program that's then tied explicitly to staying in an economically unviable occupation is that that actually increases distortion. 
And, at a, and the implementation level, it reduces gaming, because PM Kisan is at the household level, so you could imagine household splitting just to say that we double the benefit, okay? And if the fiscal constraints bind, and I'm not just saying this as an RCT wala, like, you know, but genuinely, if fiscal constraints bind, you could start this in 10% of the most backward districts and just randomize, because there's fuzziness, like, I mean, in identifying backwardness, and go evaluate it, and then think about scaling, you know, over a three-year period. Uh, so it's progressive, it's inclusive, it's sustained. I've talked about all of this. Um, but even though it's small, it's non-trivial. So as we'll show you in the next picture, it would augment consumption at the bottom by close to 15%. <laughs> Universal, portable, again, minimizing distortion and misallocation. And the idea of 1% is, again, similar to Debraj Ray, who's talked about a universal basic share. But again, that number, I think he pegged at 8 or 9%, right? Like, I mean, so those numbers come at being the numbers needed to eliminate poverty, right? So which is what puts those numbers so high to take it out of the fiscal feasible set. Okay, so here it's just a simple calculation of what this amount of income would mean at different percentiles of the income distribution. So for the rural bottom 10% or bottom 20%, it's going to augment consumption by over 10% and 15% in the bottom 5%. And even you know up to the bottom 50%, you're augmenting consumption by about 7%. Okay, so these are these are non-trivial numbers. Now there's another interesting point that people don't really pay attention to, which is if you look at the sociology and psychology of anti-poverty programs on the ground, you know, that is, there's very clear that people strongly resent programs that switch ranks, okay? So people care a lot about relative ranking and not just absolute poverty. So when you come in with a program that makes the poor richer than the guy who was just above him, like, I mean, that creates a lot of resentment, okay? So, um, and there's evidence of negative psychological effects of non-recipients non of people getting some stuff. So again, an IG just elegantly avoids all of these sociological and psychological challenges. Mm. Female empowerment, you know, I mean, frankly, I think this could be a big enough deal to just warrant this whole program just by itself, okay? Like, I mean, so, you know, we had this whole paper last year at the IPF on low female labor force participation. We have robust evidence that income in the, in the accounts of the woman, like, improves both intra-household bargaining, child health, child welfare, and the ability to leave the house for work. So, you know, that alone may warrant the returns that you would get. And, of course, all of these are good things that we want regardless. Work incentives I've already talked about. If there's one thing, again, I want to really drill into people's minds is that when people are close to subsistence, there is no trade-off between equity and efficiency, okay? So, and these small amounts can improve work incentives for the reasons we've talked about. You'll get the FI, and again, I'm not just doing this as an IPF editor, I'm doing this because it's, it illustrates that previous IPF papers have talked about policy relevant stuff. So we had this paper two years ago by Tarun Ramadurai and Vimal Balasubramaniam and Christian Badrinza, just using the Indian Debt and Asset Survey, showing that the 25th percentile Indian household has zero financial assets and savings, and the, even the median household has about 2,200 rupees, okay? So, uh, but even though this figure has improved with Jandhan, the most recent estimates are that 23% of the Jandhan accounts were dormant. Um, there's more recent evidence, again, that 48% of those with accounts did not make any deposits or withdrawals. So again, because you're getting, giving the banks these targets to open accounts, they all go and open the accounts. But most of these are just sitting there dormant. In fact, to the extent that when government of Telangana was trying to do DBT on Raitu Bandhu, their concern was that even though they had bank account details, some of these would be dormant, and then the money wouldn't be accessible, which is why they ended up partly going for a check. Okay, so again, in a way, this is then a complement to your investment in Jandhan because you're making those accounts active and alive and do stuff. Mm. Okay, and again, like I said, I think this regular inflow of funds, the data pretty strongly suggests that there is stickiness of the funds in these accounts, partly maybe just for transaction cost, but it helps you build savings. Okay, um, and then again, the two other things I get very excited about. So one, just state capacity, something we've been you know, talking about for a long time, but just think about this, right? Implementing an IGD would involve identifying every citizen, matching him or her to a bank account, and reliably sending a benefit month after month after month, which is something the Indian state has never managed to do in its 75-year history, right? Successfully reaching every person, okay, or 70-plus year history. And then as a public finance person, this gets me excited about expanding the long-term feasible set of policies, okay? So we've talked in the past about things like pollution, and econ is, the econ 101 is obvious, right? Like, I mean, you tax the bads and re debate this as an income transfer to address any issues of regressivity, but right now that's not in the feasible set of policy, okay? So this is a sense in which we get excited. And this is not a pipe dream. Five years ago, ten years ago, it would have been kind of, oh, this is just a fantasy, but it's the logical culmination of the investments in Jandhan and Aadhaar that would take us all the way to true last mile integration in the in the system of the state, and over time it augments tax capacity as well. And I think the last piece which I get most excited about is 
this idea of thinking about the cash transfer as an index fund, okay, for development. So what do we mean by this is there are people who swear by kind, there are people who say, listen, kind is so inefficient, please substitute this. So there have been pilots this government has pushed of DBT and PDS, of ICDS, but What's so interesting from our field data is how much heterogeneity there is in beneficiaries, both stated and revealed preference, okay? So we've been asking questions and preparing for these substitution pilots as to, you know, not only would people prefer DBT instead of in-kind, but we asked at what price, okay? So, and by getting the prices at which people are willing to switch, you get that entire demand curve, and that highlights the heterogeneity problem, okay? About 60% of households are willing to take DBT of an equivalent fiscal amount, but for others, they you know, the, the in-kind provision is adding more value. And then for others, it's destroying more value. So how do you deal with this heterogeneity? Once you put in an IGD, it just makes it very clear that this is an attainable benchmark. And I think over the long term, this could be the biggest benefit because by being an index fund of development, it forces the programs to justify that their administrative costs and targeting costs and other costs exceed, like, I mean, you know, uh, that the benefits they create exceed the cost, okay? So, you know, I, I, uh, just in the spirit of finance, the power of the idea of an index fund was you might be Warren Buffett, but it's on you to show you have alpha as opposed to, like, I mean, just assume that the government program is going to be better, okay? So to wrap it up, like, you know, basically, the re one of the other reasons we're excited about this policy timing is we think this is completely in the terms of reference of the Finance Commission, right? Because Finance Commission has three main goals of equality, of every citizen is treated equally, equity, whereby you provide some gap financing, and efficiency. So the first two are obvious. By construction, this is equal for everyone. The equity is obvious because of the marginal returns being higher for the poor. The efficiency point is more subtle, okay? And I think this is particularly important. So one of the most vexing challenges for the Finance Commission is that the way in which you implement equity is you provide more money to state governments in more disadvantaged places, okay? But if you look at the data, the data is also very clear that the quality of governance is the weakest in the poorest places. So this is the robust negative correlation between teacher absence and GDP per capita. So, you know, I've not labeled all the dots, but for example, in Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, it's under 15%. In Bihar, Jharkhand, it's over 35%. So, you know, the marginal effectiveness, therefore, of public spending is so much weaker in the poorer areas that if your entire equity strategy relies on the efficiency of the state government, then you're massively kind of, you know, you're, you are putting yourself at a big disadvantage, and which is also part of the political problem, right? Because citizens of better governed, better performing states are more likely to resent transfers that they see as feeding a corruption machine, as opposed to going directly, like I mean, to their peer citizens. So the logic here is therefore that the marginal value of putting a little bit of money directly in the pockets of the citizens is particularly higher in places of weaker governance. Now, Again, I'm not saying this is mutually exclusive with anything else. This is literally my last, I'm done. Okay, it's not mutually exclusive with anything else the Finance Commission can do. Part of the terms of reference does include performance-based budgeting, and that should happen. This is a complement and not a substitute. But the reason I think this is an opportune time is because it allows you to do efficiency, equity, and Okay, so central government can do this, and I think the main point I would make from a political messaging perspective is PM Kisan is obviously a big deal in terms of doing something for farmers, but Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas is literally the signature slogan of the Prime Minister. So what PM Kisan has shown is that there is fiscal space to do something of this size, and this would just over the next two years or three years be a signature achievement that is then politically incentive compatible to go back to the voters and say that We've done something that had never been done in 70 years, that we've reached every last citizen in this country in a predictable way. And there's the gender element, right? If the prime minister believes they got re-elected because of Ujwala, then this is, is again over. a direct story. So anyway, so I'll stop there. And you know, state governments can do this too, just like Raitu Bandhu had state leadership. So I'll leave my conclusion over there and stop talking. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karthik. Uh, it's a thought-provoking thought paper, and I look forward to listening to the comments by Obhijit and Arvind. But let me say a few words. I promise not to sum it up, the disc, sum up the discussion at the end. So what you have presented is a universe, not a universal basic model, but a universal model, income model, where the income to be transferred is to the individuals and not households. It's fixed at 1% of per capita GDP, 
and you think it can be accommodated within the fiscal capacity of the general government of India. And it's indexed because it's 1% of GDP, so as GDP grows, it grows. You also do not recommend that you substitute the existing in-kind subsidies by this income transfer. I suppose you assume that with the introduction of your income transfer scheme, either of two things will happen. Either they will remain unchanged in nominal terms at their current level and hence slowly fade away through inflation, or even if there is no inflation, if GDP grows, as a proportion of GDP it will become insignificant. And you carefully show that after the government has demonstrated its capacity for smooth cash transfers, beneficiaries of in-kind subsidies will opt for these cash transfers. And you have carefully also showed that how it is progressive in nature, will ameliorate poverty and have little impact on work incentives. And the money is not likely to be spent badly. It will promote financial inclusion and expand state capacity for cash transfer. So if that is the summary, I have the following questions, which even Obhijit and Arvind can answer. First, as you know, after coming down to 2.6% of GDP, below the FRBM 2003 target, stipulated in 2003, it has stubbornly remained over 3% for 11 years and was 3.3% of GDP in 2018-19. Revenue receipts of the government have declined from a peak of 11.1% to 9.1% of GDP in 2018 and 19. So what is happening is that revenue is not increasing in line with GDP, so your growth dividend that you're promising that's not showing up in the revenue receipts. So thus, if your basic income transfer at 1% of GDP is implemented without cutting down on some expenditure, how will the country sustain the declared policy of fiscal sustainability? Second, I think what Rothin Roy and Swami Iyer talk about is, I still have some sympathy, or you haven't persuaded me about that. Uh, has the time come to move from a developmental state to a compensatory state? Or will your suggested scheme be a move to a premature welfare state? Some commentators have found that they've said it's premature welfareism. Maybe it's part of the democratic game that we are playing. The risk of such a move is more than marginal, since no existing in-kind subsidies are to be trimmed, and the committed expenditure in terms of salaries, pensions, and interest payments are substantial. Will the compensation in income transfer going to come from expenditure in infrastructure, such as roads or bridges, uh, or, or education and health, and thus make a dent on the developmental activities of the state, which we know? Third, is it risky to supplant the existing subsidies with, with the universal income transfer scheme? Experience of the last few decades teach us that a subsidy once given becomes an entitlement and is extremely difficult to remove. If the existing subsidies are not cut back when the income transfer is introduced, will it be any easier to remove them later? Fourth, by moving to a targeted income transfer scheme, to a universal one, are you suggesting that we give up in improving our targeting and delivery activities, abilities and avoiding exclusion error? because I've seen some experts have suggested a targeted income transfer scheme. Is it a council in despair? You have said, just like the 14th Finance Commission will be remembered primarily for increasing allocations to states, you have told us how to become immortal. The 15th Finance Commission has an opportunity to be remembered for pushing the next level of decentralization of fiscal authority, not just to local bodies, but to citizens themselves. Is pushing decentralization to the level of citizens likely to be seen as a transgression on the jurisdiction of the states defined in the Constitution? Sixth, are you suggesting, this is the last, are you suggesting that the 15th Finance Commission should carve out 1% of GDP 
from the divisible pool of taxes for the proposed income transfer and distribute it among the union and the states on a suitable formula? If so, will it constitute a bit of an overkill in terms of infringing on the rights of the union and the state governments, duly elected, representative, and accountable entities to draw up their own spending priorities? Having said that, let me say that I found one of your suggestions, which you say that an IGD could be introduced on in a most disadvantaged districts in the coming year and assess and evaluate its performance before scaling up over the next few, few years. That's a jolly good idea, and I think you can do some RCT experiments and see what is happening at this trust. So with these comments, I'll ask Obhijit. <laughs> <laughs> But, but uh, the, the results of the RCT will come in time to the 16th or the 17th. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so we'll not have to come. That's fine. So you, just, you, you just fund the 2% and we'll do the RCT. Um, thank you for having me here. I, yeah. I, Ashok already did most of the <laughs> job, so <laughs> I, I won't. I'll, I, I, I get to be, say, kind of irresponsible things because all the responsible, fiscally wise stuff has been said. Um, so this, I like this paper. Uh, it's it's uh, not surprising. Um, let me I, I agree, start by agreeing with the conclusion. Which, uh, I'm, I guess as as is my duty, I will disagree with them. Um, it's I think that the. Uh, the the idea of uh, of IGD is very much exactly. We have a book coming out soon where we call it the universal ultra basic income, um, but it has the very much the same flavor. I, and I'll say why. I think first, I think it's it does have the uh, advantage of putting your your money where your mouth is, and I think this is uh, I. Unlike Ashok, I'm actually not particularly concerned about uh, either we, we are going to become a f five trillion rupee economy soon, no, if no, not already no, there, no. if we're not already there, I mean, let me, and, uh, we, uh, and therefore there's nothing to worry about, or else uh, this is not happening, and then maybe we really should be thinking about, you know, w future, the, the pot potential social tensions that that particular prospect might unleash, and either way, this might be a good idea. Um, I think the I think has two. I think the two big selling points, which Kartik said right at the end, so I'll emphasize. One is that I think it does create a, a useful benchmark. Are you doing better than this, rather than are you doing better than anything that happened to come into the, uh, you know, the clint in the heart of some or eye of some new minister? Uh, you know, is there some actual justification for a new scheme? I think asking the question, is this better than giving cash, is always a good one. So I, I, I like that argument. I also like the argument. I think, and there, there I do. I, I'm, I'm, I'm much less pessimistic about the ability of being able to substitute extremely inefficient transfers in the longer run. I think establishing a credible mechanism for delivering cash is central to that. If we have to have a conversation about removing distortionary subsidies, which after all, the point of distortionary is that they're not one for one. That's one for something more than one will get something for it, is that then I think that we will only be able to do it if we have good mechanisms for compensation. And I'm not sure it need, they need 100% compensation. I think the amount of electricity uh, that gets used by farmers, some of it is actually because of the form of that subsidy, it turns out to be not very useful for them and not very useful to for and, and costly for the country. So I don't think it needs one for one. I think it. I think all of those ideas will play out soon, but I think having a good mechanism for it is a good idea. Um, let me now come to what I, where I think uh, more thought uh, is needed. Uh, and I, I think there are three questions that I think we'll have to uh, think about. One is how much is, is uh, I think the idea that 
uh, you know, that they have, which is that it should be roughly what um, com consistent what, what PM Kisan has uh, suggested is one way to go. I think our job as, as social scientists is not to take the political economy too literally. I think it's, uh, this is the, I don't know where this number came out of, but I would not guess that it came out of a great deal of deep thinking about exactly where the marginal returns are. So I'm going to assume that you know, the number 6,000 rupees per year per family is just a guess, and some other guess could have been as good. And let me proceed to argue that it's too little. So I think that the, the first order point is that, you know, yes, this is a, and this is a lot of what Kartik's talk was about, that this is not just a supplemented, supplement to income, it's more than that. It's going to do good things for, and that's why we can justify it, that it will actually generate benefits. So let me take that proposition seriously. That is, sure, it's 110 rupees, it's 110 rupees. That's one way to think about it. Is it more than 110 rupees? That's the question, that's the point that Kartik was making elaborately, talking about insurance and credit and all those things. And I think there are three mechanisms that he talked about, one is insurance, one is human capital investment, and one is in investment in income raising opportunities. Um, maybe this is too small. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize when I beautified the slide that this slide became a little uh, too small, but let me say what's on this slide is actually m mostly, uh, you can read it. Uh, <laughs> it's not quite the same thing as uh, somebody at the back. Uh, insur insurance is small, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I actually think as 110 rupees per month provides n almost no insurance. That's, I think that is the conclusion. It's, it's a tiny amount of money. Uh, the big risks are, are, I think the government is very aware of it. I think both the, the Fasal Bhima Yojana, which hasn't really flown, but has the, I mean, the amount of losses they are covering are more of the order of, you know, many thousand rupees. I think the idea that this is going to be a compensation for either large income loss because of price variation, because of weather shocks, because of health shocks, I think all of those things have to be dealt with other schemes. They're just too big. They are rare, relatively rare, thankfully, and very large. And I don't think that this is this is the scheme to do that. So this is just the amount of money is too small. Uh, most of the people affected by it, this is five, seven percent of their consumption at most. And that's not the, lo that's a loss people absorb all the time. It's, uh, you know, it's not that that loss is what ruins people. It's losing, you know, suddenly have to spend five lakh rupees on surgery, that ruins people. So I think that there are different schemes that have to deal with that. I don't think insurance is, is a big argument here. Human capital investment, there's just not much evidence. I think the evidence is that human capital investment moves, and Karthik said that, kind of linearly with, uh, with uh, so spending for a while scales linearly with, with s consumption. So if you give people 6,000 rupees and they're spending 10% spending of that on health and education, they'll spend 10% more. So you know, you're going to get 600 rupees more, but you're not going to get, this is not going to be transformative. Um, income on, the, here is where the positive evidence is. The positive evidence is on, on the idea that when people get income, uh, some extra cash in their hand, they, they actually make investments which have very high returns. You know, to, the numbers are quite, sometimes quite stunning. There's, you know, 10% per month is a number you often hear. So the big numbers are off, uh, come out of these conversations. Uh, so I think that's where the really optimistic uh, ideas come from. The question to me is, where, and there's a bunch of these, uh, uh, of two, they come in two flavors. One is they are, a bunch of them come from uh, conditional cash transfers across the world. Um, and the other is they come from lump sum transfers. So uh, again, across the world. So people getting one lump sum of money and looking at the impact of that, or people getting um, the usual conditional cash transfers in Latin America and the impact of that. And both have been studied extensively, lots of RCTs, lots of other evaluations, all, I think, quite credible. And I think the, if I look at what 
what the amount that is being proposed, uh, the amounts in, in all these studies which have positive results, which is the ones they cite, all of them are basically bigger, much bigger than the amount they're talking about. And uh, uh, just to give you some examples, in Latin America, the minimum across 16 countries is $6 per month in 2008 dollars. So it's a, it's a, that's, a, that's a minimum, the, the, you know, the average is substantially higher. So that's a, that's a much bigger number um, than the one that they're talking about, which is more, you know, about a quarter of, that, of the minimum. In Kenya, there's again another, uh, uh, another of these con uh, conditional cash transfers, there's $21 per month. In Malawi, it's actually closer, but Malawi is an incredibly poor country. The, um, Ethiopia, there's another one, which, and the median is $12 per month. So the, the amounts are much bigger, like five, ten times bigger. So that's, a, that's, a, that's something to, to keep in mind is that this, this, these are, and these are, it's hard to do this comparison quite right because on the one side these are not PPP adjusted, uh, and that's uh, sort of across the board, so, but India is a bit cheaper than other countries, so maybe the PPP adjustment would make the Indian number a little bigger, because India is slightly cheaper than many of these countries. It's not also GDP per capita adjusted, and you might say that some inputs that you buy have are uh, priced spread relative to income uh, per capita. So land is more expensive in Mexico than it's in Malawi, and so that, that was going to weigh towards, uh, again, uh, making an adjust, adjustment. India is obviously poorer than Latin America, but much richer than Africa. So again, that requires an adjustment. I don't know how to do those adjustments right, so I'm not going to try to do it. But the order of magnitude seems that these, these numbers are, are smaller uh, in general. Um, another, so now why do, should I worry about it? Well, if, if it's linear, then you get returns. But I think there is absolutely no evidence that the returns are linear. In fact, Moitrish has a very nice paper where um, they estimate what, what's the threshold at which people get out of poverty. And this is a lump sum payment. The lump sum payment that they uh, are suggesting is of the order of $165 in $2007. So, you know, you can think of that being now a, a, a bigger number. So that's not a... Uh, we did a, a similar estimate for India, and that, that one we said that a critical maybe uh, investment is of the order of 7,400 rupees in 2008. So that's, a, again, a much bigger number. Um, now, is the IJT amount enough? And one way to think about it is that, you know, maybe this lump sum, you have to make a lump sum investment, it's not linear, but you know, what's the lump sum investment? Uh, can you get there by saving a little at a time? And I think Karthi, there here I really think that uh, the, all the talk about savings and how, you know, Jandhan has increased savings, the numbers are really remarkably small. You know, they, they're, Jandhan increased, this RCT shows that Jandhan increased savings from 1% to 2% of annual income. So the, 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 there is no evidence that people are going to save, you know, you give them a, a very small amount of money per month, they're going to get to uh, $200 by saving it. There's absolutely no evidence of that. Nobody, in fact, the savings rates are in a whole bunch of studies. Um, and now, uh, the savings rate are between zero and 2% across the board. Nobody, none of them have found low income people saving a lot. So I don't believe that the, what's going to happen is you give them this money, they're going to save it all up and then, then start their business. So that I don't think is happening. So therefore, I don't see a very uh, obvious mapping from this intervention to these kind of income growth opportunities that you suggested. So I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I, I think this is going to be an income supplement. It will be an income supplement and just that. Um, another two minutes? Yeah. This my, actually, maybe my last, last slide. Um, the, I think what are the design choices? One is spend more. I think that's not <laughs> rocket science. <laughs> you can think about that. Um, the second one is if you want to be if you don't want to spend more, then I think you have to think about whether you want to lump it for people. So you, do you want to make 
yearly payments rather than monthly payments. It seems to me that that, that avoids a question of savings and might very well be valuable. So you, one, I think, design choice might be to make, uh, you know, one or two, uh, two, one, two yearly payment to a family. Maybe they, they maybe, and one advantage of that is that you could still think of the basis being an individual and then offer them the option of doing that. So would you take one, two yearly payment over these monthly payments? I suspect that a bunch of people will. Uh, take take that so you can and that has the advantage that you don't have to worry about you know what's a family it's if a group of people say we'll give up our monthly transfers and take one lump sum transfer then that group of people can be defined to be a family um, some targeting would be another solution I think it's given this amount it's actually very easy to get get it down the uh, the take up because if you make it like you have to go out and sign up every week to get the money. Most people won't do it. So you, that's extreme, but you can get the take up down quite easily. So I think that's one way to get the amount up. You can just have a much uh, higher amount because you can get the take up. At these levels, the take up can be, you can get it down. Even you double the amount, you can get the take up down a lot. So I think that there are interesting design choices to think about uh, and then I think there's another set of issues we should think about, which is, um, you know, is it, is, it, is it worth thinking about some geographical targeting? So should some areas, should there be bigger coverage? Because you can imagine that, I mean, poverty is extremely geographically concentrated in India. We know where it is, so we could, we could target more. Uh, that's an easy targeting to do because it doesn't require individual data. Uh, another thing we could do is um, make it conditional on outcomes. For example, when a mine closes, do you want to increase transfers or something? So you, you, when, you, when you do environmental policies, we often leave the victims of that uh, uncovered, and we could do more than that. Finally, should be any conditionalities. I personally like the idea of making age at marriage uh, a requirement that you know you, you don't if you violate the laws law you don't get it but that's that's my particular bugbear um, so I think this is a great launching pad it's a it's a great way to start a conversation I'm sure we'll have an interesting conversation uh, here but we should continue it further thank you Kartik and thank you Maitrish. Firstly, great to be here and um, enjoyed the paper uh, very much. Uh, um, I feel a little bit, when I read it, it was preaching to not to the converted, but to the converter himself. So uh, uh, it, it was great to, great to see that. Um, I, I want to make just two or three big points. Uh, the first, I think uh, I'm uh, exactly what Abhijit said, but for completely different reasons. Uh, I think that uh, the amounts, uh, in my view, are not politically incentive compatible. Um, you mentioned PM Kisan, uh, 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 Karthik, but I think we have to leave that aside for a second because it came late, it came responsive to other things. So it's, it's a little bit more uh, complicated with PM Kisan. But let's uh, start with actually the revealed preference of for such schemes in the last few months. Huh? Uh, and let's just talk about uh, Raitu Bandhu and, uh, and the Congress proposal, right? Uh, what is, for me, fascinating about Raitu Bandhu was that here was a scheme that one highly regressive, right? I even to those within the farm community, or only to the highly regressive. And second, that it was excluding, it almost completely non-universal, just a very small set of people were getting this. And yet, why did KCR think that this was politically incentive compatible? I, despite, I, by excluding a lot, a lot of people. Why won't why won't jealousies be raised? You know, questions be raised. But despite that, he said, "Look, um, uh, I want to." Uh, and and because he did that, he was able to give more money than uh, you know than your scheme uh, proposes. So, I think that 
the, the, the big amounts for beneficiaries are, I think, absolutely politically necessary. And if you take the Congress scheme as well, a targeted in order to you know, make the, the numbers big uh, for the beneficiaries. So, so I think for the beneficiaries, the numbers have to be big to be politically incentive compatible. Now, uh, so the, going back to right to Bandhu, I mean, we all, I think, can broadly agree that it was kind of quote unquote successful because he got, you know, they did, uh, they did very well uh, in the election and everyone said right to Bandhu was part of this. So here's a scheme that uh, regressive, excluded a lot, but was able to give a lot of money to beneficiaries and therefore proved very popular. Uh, so in that sense, the two lessons I take away from this are one, uh, uh, the amounts have to be big, and two, I think what I think allowed him to do that, and then which set in train this, is this political opportunity created by the agrarian crisis. I mean, it, agrarian crisis gave rise to think, oh, there is a community deserving of this, and so people were willing not to get this in order so that other people could get it. So, so it's that combination of uh, opportunity plus big amount, relatively big amounts, which, you know, despite these huge excluding costs and, and regressive regressivity, I think did that. So, so in some sense, therefore, you know, because, you know, we're at a stage where you rightly said that now it's about let's, you know, get this idea kind of um, how to make it practical and implementable is a question because generally on the table, at least we all agree, it's a good idea. So if you want to push this forward, I, it seems to me that you need some kind of political opportunity. This, you know, bland, I'm going to give universal income, 110 a month, you know, uh, I, I don't think still is going to cut, uh, you know, political ice uh, with people. So I think uh, it has to be a little bit more, uh, you know, kind of creative that way. And, and finally, of course, it's going to be politics politicians who, who kind of uh, create this political opportunity. But I, I suspect the sums are going still far too small for a politician to say, wow, you know, vote for me because I'm going to give you 110 rupees a month. Um, so that's point number one. Um, point number two is on implementation. You know, I, you know, while I, and, uh, and Ashok knows this much better than I do, and I, even the way I think he posed the question, you know that he was saying something about, uh, you know, you know uh, whether the, the Finance Commission can really do this. I mean, they have even problems, I think, constitutionally transferring money directly to third tier, uh, and, and there's a huge debate going on. Ashok knows that much better. So I think that, you know, that I think is a non-starter. However, however, I think, uh, for me, the way forward for these kinds of policies is cooperative federalism uh, on the expenditure side, a la GST that we did on, on the tax side. Uh, and I say that for several reasons, and I'll tell you what the problem with the proposal is, but let me say why I think it's, it's, it's desirable. I think it's desirable for the states and the center to come together uh, because, A, the magnitudes can be bigger, one. Two, the scope of what can be eliminated is correspondingly greater. I mean, for example, I mean, I've had these discussions with you know, uh, state finance ministers where they've said, look, I want to do a UBI, but leave it to me, I, I'm willing to cut. You know, but leave it to me what to cut. So why don't we have mechanisms where, you know, from the existing, let's say the CSS centrally sponsored scheme, the center says, look, uh, I'm not going to tie the aid by saying do Mandrega, but supposing I were able to untie some of this and give state governments the freedom to you know, decide what they want to cut uh, in this. So, so I think that cooperative federalism uh, approach can, can make it bigger and can also increase the scope of what you can cut. So fiscally, I think that's very attractive as well. So, so that's why then, I mean, I think in the current political conjuncture, I mean, let's face it, GST worked in part because, or in large part, because there were, you know, BJP at the center and 17 BJP guys sitting around the states and, you know, you get consensus. We still have that configuration today. 
uh, maybe in spades, even more. Uh, so why don't we use this um, you know, cooperative federalism model, but not through the Finance Commission, because I don't think it's feasible, but through the, on the expenditure side, have this and, and have it implemented. See, the problem with what I'm proposing, which is why I think um, we'll have to have more op an option or a menu-based approach where you know, states can do it on their own, center can do it, is, is that by definition, cooperative federalism means that no one party can appropriate the political benefit from, from this. You know? So if states are going to give and center is going to give, the center cannot say, look, I'm giving you all this money. And so that dents the attribution that you need with, for political incentive compatibility. So I think uh, that uh, uh, is, is, is a constraint. But I think uh, that kind of, for me, uh, is the way forward in actually trying to make this implement. And I think, you know, I think there are, if the center were to say we will you know, untie some of our schemes, I suspect more states will come up and say, look, very good. And, and, and you know, it could be untied with some conditionality. I say we untie it so that you can do a universal basis income, something like that can happen. Uh, uh, that's. So now, my last, uh, 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 last uh, point here would, would be the following. That, you know, my own preference in this, uh, in these kind of schemes, or at least something that we should be open to, is, you know, th th there's this kind of targeting and there's universal basic income. I, I think that, especially if there are resource constraints and all these other constraints, I think we should be open to thinking of uh, models of quasi-universality where you target out rather than target in. Uh, and, and I think you know uh, th there are many ways which you can do it. For example, uh, you know my colleagues and I, uh, you know who are students of, of uh, you and, and, and Abhijit, propose that you know a one version of a, of a PM Kisan, etc., would be to give it to you know the entire rural population, but take out the last you know the top 10% or 15% based on SECC, because the implementation obviously universality is easier. Targeting in it's tough, but targeting out could be easier than targeting in. So. Uh, um, uh, uh, so, so th those are my three points. The last point is that this whole debate on this compensatory state versus redistributive state, I think at some level is kind of almost in, um, in terms of politics is in a bit of la-la land. I, I don't think really a any state government says, oh, uh, because I'm going to do universal ba basic income, I will stop, you know, or I will implement my education things any worse or any better. So I think it becomes a little bit of a, a, a theoretical argument, and I kind of have less sympathy for that. Thank you. We'll take a few questions. Professor Indira Rajaraman, then Rajneesh, then here. And then Dilip. Okay. Um, I think the chairman, uh, Professor Lari, um, uh, expressed the fiscal opposition to your paper very effectively, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, I want to talk about the negative scatter that you put up um, of, uh, against, of teacher absenteeism against the per capita income of states. And if I understood you correctly, you were inferring from that uh, that per capita income of states stood, stood for governance capability. And further inferring from that, if I'm, if I'm not you know, uh, reaching too far, uh, that uh, a case could therefore be made for retreating from the supply of particular goods and services and moving towards a more generalized uh, income purchasing power uh, kind of transfer. Um, if you had done a scatter of teacher absenteeism uh, against uh, the number, the percentage of villages uh, reached with all-weather roads, uh, the kind of thing that is being targeted by the PMGSY, I think you would ha have a similar scatter with exactly the same states at the low end and at the high end. So um, Maharashtra, let's say, where the absentee rate is low, would also be uh, a state where the percentage of villages covered with all-weather roads would be very, very high. So um, that would give you a completely different interpretation of a scatter of that nature, because it would make the case for public provision of things like public goods, like roads. And in, this, in the present juncture in our country, where the, the, the number one problem that, that the Indian population faces is water scarcity. I mean, we are hitting international headlines uh, with, with the water problem in our country. Um, I would think that, that the, the kind of scatter you present um, also influences the conclusions that you draw. Thank you. Uh, 
My questions are of a clarifying nature. Um, you mentioned, uh, you've used terms like IRR, index funds, um, et cetera. So l l let me try to make these things concrete. First of all, you said you want to give 1% of GDP. Well, that amount has to come from someplace. If it comes from taxes, taxes, I just looked at uh, the paper by uh, Rakesh Mohan, which is on our desk, it's about 10 to 12 percent of GDP. At the center, yeah. Center plus state is 18. Yeah. So the transfer is going to be a fairly large fraction of taxes. So if you have a balanced budget, then obviously it is going to crowd out something else, something that was going to be spent um, on alternative projects, et cetera, um, now cannot be done unless, of course, uh, you increase the tax rate, um, et cetera. So, the, um, so it wasn't clear to me uh, whether this was uh, politically feasible. Um, but you said it's not going to crowd out. So I wasn't very clear about uh, what you meant, meant by that. The other thing is you, you mentioned that banks are in the business of lending and not borrowing. I mean, in a closed economy, for every borrower, there is a lender, right? And households are borrowers and lenders, so there are two sides to the balance sheet. Uh, um, and if you look at rates, realistic rates of saving, say about 2%, that's a doubling of every 36 years. That's a, that's a long time to, you know, ha accumulate balances in your account. So. I think the, the question is about where is the indexation coming on or anything. I think that's a red herring because I don't think that comes into the picture here. Our IRR is a very misleading number. That just tells you what the number will be when the net present value is equal to zero. It just tells you a cutoff rate. If, if the cost of capital is lower than that, it may be interesting to invest in that project. But I just wanted to see, you know, some, some clarification on, on, on these issues. Finally, whether this is going to be effective or no is an empirical question. I mean, if uh, you really cannot answer this in a closed room, a uh, dark room, whether I give you 110 rupees and w what you would do with it, whether it will you know, substitute for something else. So that, that's an empirical question. Uh, and I doubt if you can answer it on any theoretical basis. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, uh, uh, Ashok. Um, my comments are actually more in line, Ashok, with yours, but maybe a little more direct. Let me put it this way directly. This is one economist's bad idea whose time has not come, to put it directly. Um, and just to add to the arithmetic that uh, uh, Rajni just gave, um, the revenue expenditure of the central government was 10.6% of GDP in 2018-19. Of that, interest was 3.1%, subsidies 1.6%, defense around between somewhere between 1.5 and 2. That tolls to somewhere between 6 and 6.5. So what was left was around 4% thereabouts. So your proposal is saying of the rest, there's only central government, not including the state government, 25% of that expenditure should go in free cash to all citizens of the country. As economists, as economists, you cannot escape, right, the allocation of resources. A, where is this money coming from? Is it additional? If so, from where? Is it from foreign borrowing, as the government is proposing to do now? Um, or something else? And as again, Rajni said, what expenditure are you not going to do? And this is when there's huge crying needs in the country for public services that are not being, not private goods, public services not being provided, whether it is roads, rural roads, you want to focus on rural roads, water, uh, Indra you mentioned, rural and urban, even in the best, even in the best localities of our biggest cities, you cannot get clean water. Um, health services, public health services, sanitation services, I mean, you can you get a whole list. So if you had about 160,000 crores a year to give away, would you allocate to those? 
what is required for growth. In fact, one of the things I've been noticing among economists' meetings in India for the last number of years, there's not one session on growth, neither at Nimra nor today, except for what CEA was talking about this morning, except the CEA wants to borrow money from abroad to do growth. Um, so I think these are very, very serious issues. And this proposal is almost like, have American Express card will travel, regardless of whether you have any money in the bank account. Thank you. Dilip? So I share a lot of your enthusiasm and indeed excitement about the scheme. But I just want to point out that if you want to compare it with some of the existing in-kind leaky uh, systems that we have, like Enriga, for instance, there are some trade-offs. So it's not, you know, it's not all one way. Uh, so first, Enriga has an element of self-selection. So uh, it is leaky and so forth. But a universal or a near universal scheme is also has a targeting problem that a lot of people who are not poor are also receiving the money. So there is a trade-off there. So Clement Imbert, uh, I think this is an article in the EPW in the last one or two years. So he calculates, so given NSS data and his analysis of the effects of Enriga, he compares what would have happened to the poverty gap ratio if the government had spent the same amount on a direct crash transfer, but to everybody. And he does it state by state. And when you look at the effect on the poverty gap, okay, it depends on exactly what elasticities you build into the exercise, okay, or, or sensitivity to uh, the depth of poverty. And it varies by state. So all I'm saying is that there, there are some trade-offs there, and in some cases, Enrica does better. Okay, second point, the delivery mechanism. Clement's uh, analysis assumes that cash transfers reach people 100%. Now, if money is going to be sent into bank accounts, this question of functioning bank accounts arises. So not everybody has a bank account. And then of those with bank accounts, the proportion that you quoted from the World Bank FinTech survey is about 25%. I did surveys in West Bengal for the last, uh, over the last year, and I found roughly the same number. 25% don't have functioning bank accounts. And not everybody has bank accounts. It's about 10% don't have bank accounts. So you, you have a gap of about 35%. And not surprisingly, it's the most vulnerable, the less literate, the lower caste people and so forth, people with less land, are much more likely to be prone to this. So for them, you have to find some other way of transferring money. And it will have to be some kind of intermediate. So I know stories of how people, when they receive they have to uh, go to get their money deposited into their bank accounts for Indriga. They go on the t every Tuesday, there's some bigwig in the village who takes them, and they stand outside the bank while the bigwig goes in, gets the money, keeps his cut, and gives the rest. So there is a leakage which doesn't show up in the data. Okay, so there is yet another, okay. So anyway, for 35% of the population, there are some leakages. And finally, the kind of issues that John Drez has raised with regard to, let's say, if there is a drought or if there is some kind of a local food shortage, then you know, PDS, since it's delivering the commodity itself directly, is going to provide better insurance. And uh, I remember, Moitresh, you did a study of the bicycle scheme in Bihar, where people given the option between the bicycle and equivalent cash. In the more remote areas, they actually prefer to receive the bicycle. So again, so there are these trade-offs, and I think the suggestion that Abhijit made about geographic targeting may be quite important here. So you might want to index it to some kind of local, you know, rainfall, drought, as well as local cost of living. I agree with some of the comments that have been made, but let me just add, uh, supplement a few things. Uh, one is actually I uh, endorse what Arvind said. Um, in some sense, it is too small for political reason. And let me give you a, in fact, in my old writings on universal basic income, I've also mentioned this, but from a, you, you, you guys talked about farmers, but from a different uh, group. I said one of the big problems of labor movement in India is that labor movement is highly divided. There are these formal, sec formal sector laborers with small number and large ocean of informal laborers. And basic income has the political advantage of mob 
possibly potentially mobilizing informal sectors behind them. Already the largest informal worker association in India, uh, SEVA, has already is advocating basic income. Now there, if you quote a small figure, like 110 rupees per month, this is not going to, this mobilization of these large numbers of uh, unorganized laborers, you need to have some uh, much more substantial figures uh, to really excite them to do the mobilization. So politically, I think uh, it's too small. That is the original reason in my own work on universal basic income, I started thinking big, not because I like big amounts to be given, but because of political uh, viability. Uh, one uh, side point uh, about why I never want it to be percentage of GDP, whether it's 1% or 0. If you promise that 1% of GDP, uh, let me half, in half jest tell you what it is going to do, do to the GDP debates that you are having. <laughs> So there will be even more political manipulation of GDP. Whereas if you promise uh, 5,000 rupees or whatever, then at least politicians next year, somebody say, oh, I didn't get my 5,000 rupees. But if you say 1% of GDP you're going to get, then GDP, first of all, nobody has any idea what GDP is. Uh, and secondly, uh, we already know uh, political manipulation. Uh, second point that I wanted to mention is uh, I personally think that you cannot completely avoid substitution. And that's why even originally, even the first time I talked about universal basic income in 2011, I immediately thought about substitution. But then I was talking about substitution of non-merit subsidies, and then uh, in the budget there is uh, revenues foregone, etc. You add them up. It's a significant amount. But more than that, we all talk about tax GDP ratio in India is low. But then, we, and, and we talk about this fiscal constraint. There's so many things, water, uh, roads, um, infrastructure, health, education. So for this whole thing, plus universal basic income, taxes have to be raised. On, on whom, that's a different issue. Uh, a, a country in which wealth inequality is galloping, not to tax wealth, not to tax inheritance, um, not to uh, under, under taxation of capital gains, under taxation of property taxes, uh, and issues we should, you know, it's, it's politically impossible. No, I think if you, if you make trade unions and informal workers association worked up about that, there will be demands for more taxation of the rich. Uh, I know there are incentive issues, et cetera, but we should go into that. Instead of just saying tax GDP ratio is low, fiscal limit, resource constraint. I think that should not be the end of the uh, uh, picture. Last point. And this is a, actually a conceptual point, philosophical point. Most of you look at basic income or basic income supplement, actually, that's what we're talking about. In terms of anti-poverty, I think the scope should be much larger. Whatever your poverty line is, by, the, by and large, we're talking about 20 to 25% of the population. Take the next 30, 40%, above that 25% or 20%, they suffer from tremendous amount of insecurity, all kinds of insecurity, including some of the risks that Karthik mentioned. Uh, I think we should expand our horizon beyond anti-poverty to anti-insecurity, anti-economic insecurity. And my last statement with respect to that would be, I have always looked upon basic income as part of a basic right. Just as the Supreme Court has said, uh, interpreted the right to life to include right to food, why not right to a minimum economic security? And in, from that, if we right to life includes right to minimum economic security, 
then basic income should be a part of right to life uh, or some kind of a right, not anti-poverty. So I, I just want to expand the horizon beyond, uh, beyond the anti-poverty program. We have got exactly seven minutes. I think I have already, seven minutes, two minutes are gone. Koshik, then Devesh, and the young lady I can't, don't Two uh, very brief comments. Uh, directly to you, I've, I should just second uh, something that uh, Professor Bardhan just mentioned. The iner not having an iner inheritance tax to me is a shocking moral lapse in any situation. But uh, to your point, uh, broadly something uh, universal uh, I'm in sympathy with, so I think it's a good idea. Two things. One, on the fiscal side, you should keep in mind, uh, it takes off from what Dilip is saying a little bit. Uh, the delivery cost, if you do it properly, at least in the beginning, is going to be pretty substantial. Uh, reaching it to everybody is going to be large. This is going to go down over time. As more people have banks, you can finally just switch um, a, a button on a keyboard and it'll go, but that'll take time. So you ought to fiscally take account of that. The other one is a bit of a behavioral suggestion. Sounds odd to economists, but I think it's important. This thing about targeting, for such a small amount, you should, in fact, I would urge you to put that into the proposal. You don't really target, you appeal. You appeal to people that if you are above a certain amount, forego this. You can take it, but you forego this. This is the kind of competition at the top that I've foregone, I hope you have foregone, is a worthwhile kind of value to instill into people. So I would do the targeting, and if you can get rid of 20% of the people at the top foregoing this, that's 20% of that money saved, which is huge. Devesh? Uh, I'm sort of curious. The, the allocations are made at the individual level, but expenditure decisions are usually made at the household or the family level. Given that, what do you think would, might be the marginal impact on fertility of this decision? Very short question, please. Could you speak a little bit more about uh, having the robust insurance infrastructure versus the supplemental uh, income program? Kartik, you have exactly half a minute to answer. <laughs> 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 I want to uh, okay, no, I, I, all I can say is that given the limited time and uh, given um, um, uh, the whole range of issues were covered, I cannot help but crack a, a joke or rephrase a joke, which is there was this wise man called Mullah Nasiruddin who was once asked to give a lecture to people and then he asked, who, you know, what do you know about this topic? Everybody says nothing. Then he said, I couldn't bother to answer or give a lecture. Then he was asked, you know, next time he came, he said, what do you know? They said, we know everything. They said, what's the point for me lecturing? <laughs> the third time, half the room says, we know everything. The other room says we know nothing. They says, why don't you, the guys who know everything, say. So yes, it's too little. Yes, it's too much. And I think there are extremely credible ans you know, uh, arguments we heard here that those says that the amount is too little. And I, I'm extremely sympathetic to it. And those who said it's not feasible because it's too much. And I don't think I can say anything in, in, in now that my negative time endowment has kicked in, uh, say anything to persuade you otherwise. I just make one or two uh, slightly more substantive points than this more lighthearted remark. So one is I, you know, I, I agree with the uh, I agree with the general thrust of these arguments um, of of uh, you know if I take Abhijit's comments about uh, the amount being small and also Arvind and Pranab and others who said, I would just say that look it's also a part of framing you know if behavioral economics is now in a, as a chapter of economic survey as we heard this morning and some of us have looked at it, it's uh, about six thousand rupees per family per year, and that's not if you, even if you take the Bangladesh Bangladesh number that Abhijit quoted out of my uh, paper uh, with Oriana Bandiera et al. Uh, if you convert that, uh, if, if you really, the annual uh, amount, total amount you take, it's not that far off, especially if this uh, allows you to top it up with some credit. So therefore, it's not, it's not in the, I mean, admittedly, it's, it's very small, but it's not in the uh, kind of realm of, uh, of, of uh, impossibly uh, trivial amount. And the number two point, I, I'm with, uh, in fact, everybody here that, uh, look, uh, as, as, as Pranab uh, mentioned, that 
by committing 1% of GDP, we have solved the national income controversies. I mean, I would just frame exactly this point that now you know that you have not any room to have, you know, any fuzzy or funny or smoky statistics because this is an amount that everybody, including maybe your own family members, will knock at your door and says, what happened to my IGD? So I don't think there's a... And fundamentally, last point, and I, I, I will respect the time constraints and, and also, um, um, uh, again, in, 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 in genuinely uh, benefiting from a range of views here, which were all, all useful. Uh, I think a negative income tax is the way to go here. I don't fundamentally think so. Therefore, all this sort of we are skirting around the fact that, look, you know, something has to be cut. Even if it's incremental, something has to be cut, etc. You know, we understand there's a budget constraint. You know, T times Y is equal to B. You know, we, we understand that. And so, therefore, I think at some level, it's a matter of some form or some version of a negative income tax where whatever is the gross benefit that's lump sum gets uh, adjusted with some form of taxes that will come out of you. But anyway, I'll stop here. I'll be happy to, both of us will be happy to sort of uh, answer more questions individually outside. Thank you. One minute. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I think, yeah, so, um, so just two quick things. I think the two most common themes were, where is the money coming from? Rakesh, Ashok, uh, I think everybody. I think, again, we just keep forget. when you say roads and water, of course, roads and water are going to do better. But the point about, maybe we did this too fast, but if you look at the expenditure, the majority of it is, in fact, publicly provided private goods or redistribution as opposed to the pure public goods. So it's kind of in that space. That uh, uh, so, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, I'll, I'll address the scatter later, right? Like, I mean, I think the, the main point is there is a lot of incredibly, you know, value destruction in government services so high that I basically think about this as providing an accountable benchmark for the quality of public expenditure. So I think that's point one. Second one on, on size, the only way you get bigger is by targeting, and so that creates a bunch of problems. And I think let's close with the note that agreeing with Rajneesh and agreeing with everything else, that fundamentally it's an empirical question, right? So, and maybe where we can move forward on this is to create a little bit of a space for experiments with perhaps, you know, co-financing for states to come in, like Arvind said, for the amounts to be bigger, and with some careful evaluation. So. Thank you very much. I think we have overshot the time, but you must agree with me that it was a stimulating session. <laughs> so let's give a hand to the panel participants. Thank you.